Wow, that's great. Uh, the theme of the conference, of course, is important. I want you to get some of the rights of notes down. I'm going to talk about friendship tonight, and tomorrow we'll talk about wealth. These are the two specific uh, focuses I think uh, you, have, you will see clear in our brochures. So please get a notebook, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, the theme of this event this year is discovering friendships and building wealth. Both of these are strategies for enhancing your life. Uh, I'm going to talk about friendships tonight. And many of the other speakers are going to be dealing with, of course, the strategies for building wealth. I will talk a little bit about that tomorrow with my colleague, uh, Brother Ferguson. But tonight, I want to focus on friendship. And uh, I want to recommend a few books, and they're going to be on special tonight. The first one, of course, is the book entitled Single, Married, Separated, and Life After Divorce, one of our best-selling books. We sold over a million copies of these books now, and it's still in the top 10 best-selling list, and so I'm very proud of that, and people are being helped by this. It's in about four different languages now, so if you want to get a copy tonight, the regular price of this book is 15 bucks, but tonight you get it for 12 okay? And I'll be happy to autograph books afterwards. The second book I'm going to recommend is called The Power of Woman. It deals with the five needs of a female. Very important for male and female to read this book to understand how to relate to the female factor. And there's a book that goes as a partnership to this book. It's called The Purpose and Power of Men. It deals with the five needs of a male also so that all of us can learn how to relate to each other. Now, both of these books are 30 bucks, but uh, if you get all two of them to tonight, you get them for $20, so you save 10 bucks only tonight, please. Okay, so you want to do that. Uh, invest in yourself, invest in someone else you, who you may know, and uh, you can get these materials for them. And finally, I want to say that uh, the book on uh, love and marriage is a very important book for unmarried people to read because you want to get knowledge before you get involved in relationships. You don't want to learn on your way down. And uh, so it's very important to prepare yourself. I'm telling you, I've had so much counseling sessions that were basically unnecessary that people got the information before. So I want to recommend those to you. And uh, you can get two of those books, of course, as well for a special of 25 bucks. So I want to recommend those to you. Uh, tonight, my focus is going to be on success strategies for discovering friendships. And we're going to talk about how that relates to wealth. And I want to begin with a few verses from the Bible, my favorite book. I want you to look up these verses tonight. If you've got your iPad Bible, I want you to turn with me as well. And those who got your Bible with you, I want you to turn to Proverbs. We're going to read chapter 12, verse 26. Now, these are verses that you never saw before. People normally say, you know, I read a Bible that doesn't exist because they say I find things that they couldn't find before. Well, here's a verse that is tucked away in the Bible, very important verse, and it talks about friendship. And here's what it says, the New International Version of Proverbs chapter 12, underline verse 26. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully. Isn't that amazing? Never saw that before, huh? The righteous choose their friends, how? Carefully. Hmm. The next statement says, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Which means that obviously a, a, a true friend doesn't lead you astray. And astray would mean you are going in a specific direction to a specific destination. And whoever you choose doesn't lead you away from that destination, which means that a true friend helps you get to your destination. So that means you choose people who are either going in the same direction or who have assets that can help you get to where you want to go. Anyone else is not a true friend. Another verse I want you to read, another surprise one, is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Secret verse again. Proverbs 18, verse 24, NIV, it says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. Let me repeat that. Proverbs 18, verse 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. 
but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He was unreliable, unreliable friends. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves all the time. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. All your family shows up at a funeral. Amazing. But your friends show up when your house burns down. Or when you got a new house. It doesn't matter. They're always there. But family normally shows up in tragedy. A friend loves all the time. When you have your bad ways or your good ways. Had a good day or a bad day. Your friend is consistent. I want to read another couple of statements from the Bible. Proverbs 27 verse 6. Another interesting verse. I memorized this one when I was about 14 years old. This is still a very important verse to me. It says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That means the wounds from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies kisses. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Friends are people who could have a good fight. And then the next day go for lunch. That's a friend. A friend will rebuke you and tell you to your face what they are concerned about. And they may even come against your plans and warn you about things that they don't think is good for you. And it hurts your feeling. But that wound is faithful. So good friends don't always agree with you. That's what I'm saying. A true friend may disagree if they believe what you are doing will take you away from your goals. So don't despise those who may be honest with you. Another verse I want you to find is Proverbs chapter 19. This is the last one. Verse 4. I like this one because this one is connected to our theme and hopefully... Uh, speakers will pick this one up and use it for the rest of the weekend. Proverbs 19, verse 4. I quote, Wealth attracts many friends. <laughs> but even the closest friend of the poor deserts him. I like this verse. <laughs> Let me say it again. Wealth attracts many friends. But even the closest friend of the poor deserts him. This is a very interesting verse. It probably shouldn't even be in the Bible. But I guess Solomon who wrote this, just telling the truth. When you get plenty of money, everybody want to be your friend. You ain't got nothing, everybody gone. That's why I'm happy for this theme. You better get some wealth. So you can attract. Come on, y'all talk to me. Some friends. Especially if you're looking for a mate. Because you don't want to marry a deficit. Or a parasite. Mm. I guess the principle is teaching us is simple. And that is when you improve your value... You attract people. That's what it means. When you improve how much you are worth, you attract people. And this is why you should constantly be adding to your worth. Adding to your value in life. And you can do that not just with money. You can do it with education. You can do it with promotion on a job. You can do it with beginning your own business. In other words, people are attracted to those 
who are focused on adding value to their lives. Maybe that's a good measure for you today to check, see if people are avoiding you. Because you don't have value in their eyes. Uh, I learned years ago, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, but let me just touch you on this now, because I discovered, and even from my experience with, with people in very high wealth categories, and I've had opportunity to be with many people with a lot of money, I discovered that you don't need really money to be wealthy. You just need wealthy friends. <laughs> if you broke and I broke, we're bad company. Am I right? If you ain't got nothing and I ain't got nothing, let's go get some. <laughs> so your friendships determine your value also. And yet your value attracts friendship. I want to talk then now about friendship and the principles of successful friendships. And I do want to stress that there's a book on the table that I didn't talk about. And it's a book that I wrote some years ago. And it's a very successful book worldwide. The book is called Waiting and Dating Without Mating. Let me repeat it again. Waiting and Dating Without Mating. And the book has the first four chapters just on friendships. Because we don't know how to really build pure friendships. Most people are afraid to develop friendships because the people who they develop relationships with misunderstand their intention. And so we basically avoid friends completely. And we try to isolate ourselves because it seems as if every time we try to be a friend with someone, they won't marry us. And all we want is a friend. So we don't have the skills sometimes, nor do our culture allow us to have skills to just have good friendships. And I want to talk to you about how to build strong friendships uh, today. Now, first of all, let me start by saying that all of us were created by God to be social creatures. The first defect, if I can use that term, that God found with his creation was he realized that it was not good for man to be alone. That was the first defect. No other defects God found, just that one. And what did God do to solve the problem? This is important to understand what God did to solve the problem of aloneness. God did not create a spouse for the man. If you read the text carefully, let me try and explain the words that were used. It says, it's not good for man to be alone. Write the word alone down, but put two L's in it. That is what the word actually means in the Hebrew. Alone means to be all one. It is not good for man to be all one. Now, what that means is, God designed the human to actually share his life. If you study humanity, God did not create the female from the soil. He created her out of the man, which means that she was trapped in the man. And he went inside and took her out. Why? They were all one. That means there was no one for Adam to give to, to talk to, to fellowship with, to communicate with, and to experience life with. He was all in one. God said, this is not good for man to be all in one. Another word that the Hebrew translates the word isolated. Write it down. God doesn't want anyone to be isolated. That means to be unto yourself. It is not good for man to be isolated in himself. So what does God do? He goes into the man and pulls out a, a womb man, a man with the womb. Now what's important here is, and singles, people got to understand this. I talk about this in some of my works, but God did not give Adam a wife to solve the aloneness problem. He simply gave Adam 
another one like himself. You would find in the second chapter of Genesis, before God made the woman, there was a little discourse God had with himself. He says, well, uh, for every bird, there was a bird. For every cow, there was a cow. For every sheep, there was a sheep. But for man, there was none suitable. That means man and women were never designed to have a dog as a companion. Now, I know some of you all love your dog and... You know, you figure your your dog is the best friend, but let me tell you something. uh, There's some needs the dog can't meet. You all talk to me, sit up straight. Someone got a nice cat. That that, that cat can only go so far. When you want to talk to somebody, cat don't talk back to you. Cat can't give you sex. Mm -hmm. Can't take the cat down the aisle. The dog can decently handle some things. So the Bible says for every dog, there's a dog, every cat, there's a cat. But for man, there was none suitable. Therefore, I will make for him one fit, suitable. But God didn't make a spouse. Which means that God really intended for you to just have friends to solve your aloneness problem. That's important. You don't need to be married to not be alone. You just need another human in your life that you could relate to. Somebody you can share joy with. You can share time with. You can share your resources with. This is what life is supposed to be. And the problem is our culture says that is impossible. The minute you turn 40 and you ain't married, they think you're a lesbian or homosexual. And when in fact, you're just happy. <laughs> I ain't got a problem. I don't want to be married. I'm happy. I got some friends. We go and eat lunch together. We go, you know, watch games together. I'm happy. Leave me alone. But the culture says that's not possible. If you read the text very carefully, God did not give Adam a wife. He simply gave him another human who could receive from him. And he could exchange with. It is Adam who says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I will call her wombed man because she came out of man. And then it says, Adam began to prophesy. For this cause should a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife and two shepherds. In other words, he's the one who chose to be wife. God just made woman. Adam made a wife. This is important. Because God will never choose your mate. If God chose your mate, then you could blame him for all your problems. You can make him respond for your bad choice. God will not choose your mate. God will give you, let me just quote the word. In my research, I found this very interesting. The word God used, the Bible says, and the Lord God brought the woman to the man. The word brought, the, it's the Hebrew word, means to parade before. And that's all God does. He parades people before you. Hey, parade. You're the one who look and then start prophesying. Not as bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I'm going to choose that. And once you choose it, God makes you respond for your own choice. He will never choose your mate. Now, so God made us social creatures. Here's something important to remember. We relate on three levels as human beings. First, spirit. Secondly, soul. And thirdly, physical. The body. Now, We are triune beings. We all have those three parts. And we need a relationship with social environment, with people on those three levels. The problem is we don't know how to relate on those three levels properly. And that's why this is important to talk about friendships. Because healthy relationships should always begin on the spiritual level, then the intellectual level. We normally go the opposite way. We begin with the physical level. First, we look at how they look. Then we smell them. (laughs) See how they dressed. We try to look how they physically appear. We start with the physical. 
And then we begin to move into the physical. We begin to touch one another. And then we arouse one another. And chemical actions begin to take place. And, and then we get involved physically, sexually. Never had an intellectual relationship first. There are some people who woke up married and didn't know the person they married except they only knew their bodies. They had no relationship with them intellectually, none of them emotionally, none of them intellectually or psychologically or any way, especially spiritually. They don't know the person at all, but it's too far gone now. You consummate a relationship in the physical, it's difficult to begin to create one in the spirit. Because your conscience will keep blocking your spiritual relationship. Friendships. Let's talk about them. Write this down. The foundation for all healthy relationships are on the level of, number one, purpose. Number two, motivation. Number three, interest. This is where friendship really should begin. When you talk about getting to know people and becoming friends with them, you want to begin on the level of purpose. Is this person aware of their purpose in life? Because you don't want to waste your time with people who don't know where they're going. Hmm. I'm a very strange guy. I, 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 I take about five seconds to assess whether I want to spend five minutes with you. Because life is time. What is life? Time. And whatever life we possess, we bought it with our time. We call it spending time. You spend it to buy your life. And whoever you spend it with, you are buying their life. Purpose. Motivation and interests. The fourth one is dreams. Healthy relationships should be built on what motivates the person. And, and, am I motivated by the same kind, kind of passion? I'm, I'm not talking about getting married to anyone. Just, just developing friendships. Interests. You want to go smoke dope and I want to go to church. Two different interests. So right away we can't be friends. Our interests are different. You want to stay up all night, I want to go to sleep. You want to go to the club, I want to go to prayer meeting. In other words, interests is where friendship begins. And then dreams. Some people ain't got no dreams. And all you got is dreams. That's bad company. <laughs> Friendships. The fifth one is personality. And this is very important. One people don't think it is, but you know... Uh, <laughs> Let me read the verse again that I read to you, the first verse. It says, the righteous does what? Choose their friends carefully. There's another verse uh, that I saw that blew my mind, and it says, let me find it for you. It says, in the book of Proverbs, it says, do not make friends with a man of, of short temper. That means woman too, of course. You know, this is very good stuff here. That's talking about personality. It says, another verse says, do not make friends with one who has a quick temper and is angered quickly. Personality. There's some people who have some bad upbringing. And their culture and their character has not been formed. And they won't be your friend. And they can't carry a good conversation without losing their control. You know, life is too short to spend your life trying to figure people out. <laughs> life is too short. Personality. Here's the signs of true singleness. I thought I'd give you this quote here. And this is from my book on dating. Uh, 
If you want to be a, a, a complete person or measure whether you are whole as a single person to make friends, here's one of the measures. A truly single person is one who is complete physically, emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually without dependence on anyone else. And this sounds like an impossible feat. But believe me, uh, if you're going to be successful in life, this will be your goal right here. You want to get to the point where you don't need anybody to feel like somebody. If you depend on other people to give you value, to give you worth, and to make you feel important, then you are going to be a problem in relationship. Uh, relationships are really built on the idea that because you are so complete, you can share yourself with someone. And this is the heart of being what I call completely single. Most of you have read my books on this or listened to some of the CDs and you know my definition of singleness is very unique. And I got this from research again. To be single means to be separate, unique, and whole. Separate means that you don't need anyone to be somebody. Whole means that you have a complete sense of yourself and your worth within yourself. Unique means that you know that you got something no one else got and that's why they need you. When you get those three things together, you become valuable to life. And whether people like you or not, it doesn't matter anymore because you like yourself. So a single person is a very strange person. Their best friend is themselves, and they can hang out with themselves for days. Anybody there yet? See, single people are people who don't always be looking around for someone to go shopping with. You go shopping by yourself even. Single people go to restaurants and say, I want a table with one chair, please. <laughs> And you order yourself the best meal on the menu and eat it by yourself. I don't feel guilty at all. I'm enjoying this. I'm treating myself today. Single people have a sense of wholeness. That's why people love to be with them. Some people are so difficult to be because they, they are high maintenance. You know what I'm talking about? You got to talk to them all the time. You got to tell them how good they look all the time. You got to listen to all their problems all the time. Always complaining. Man, you too high. I'm, I'm gone out of here. Some of you are wondering why people avoid you. You are high maintenance, man. Too much demands you make on people. You know, just to be with you is, 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 a, is, a, is a, a stress. <laughs> tell you, he's talking about you. He ain't talking about me. So when you are single, you can make friends. Let's talk about friends, friendship a little bit. First of all, true friendship is the strongest relationship in the world. True friendship. And here's why. There are three levels of friendships. And each level of friendship carries responsibilities that are different. And this is, I'm going to talk to you about how to build friendships today. I'm going to give you actually four levels, but three are going to be focused on in this session, all right? And uh, Jesus had three levels of friendships. And that's why I know they're so important. He had three levels. Jesus Christ had 12 men, but three set of friends. The 12 were all his acquaintances. He chose them to be with him. Then there was the three. And then there was the one. And he treated them differently. There are certain things that he only took the three to see. I wonder how the nine felt. There are certain things he only said to one and told him not to say to anybody else. He gave secrets to certain levels of those people and then told him, don't talk to anyone else about this. He was conscious that not everybody could be in the same circle. I wonder if you understand friendships. There are some things you don't tell everybody. There are some things you don't show everybody. And there are some people who don't want to be in a close circle at all. You keep them at a distance. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Even Jesus had circles of friends. When he went to the Mount Transfiguration, he said, only you three come. You three come. The nine never saw him transfigured. 
And then he told them, don't tell anybody what you saw. That means they came down the mountain and they keep quiet and didn't tell the other nine what they saw. There are some secrets you should keep to protect your own friend. Hmm. And there are some things you tell people because you trust them. That's why a close friend can betray you. Only a close friend can betray you. And a close friend is someone who has your secrets. Friendships. Let me give you the levels of friendship. Number one, acquaintance. What is acquaintance? This is the lowest level of friendship. The lowest level. Why? Because it is viewed as a divine appointment. This is important. Every time you meet somebody, view them as a divine appointment. When you first meet a person, it, that's not a mistake. In the airport, at a bus stop, in a food store, hello, hi. You know, don't ignore people. Because the person you meet casually could end up being your spouse. Or may be the one to finance your dream. They were sent to solve one of your problems. This is why it's important to be friendly to everybody. You don't know who they are and why they came. God normally has your solution in someone else. <laughs> he has your paycheck in someone else's pocket. So you got to be careful who you ignore. Sometimes the, the, the greatest answer to your prayer is in someone you walk past and didn't speak to. Because you were so high-minded and proud. You, you, you got to be careful. Uh, it's important to have acquaintance. Just get acquainted with people. If I tell you how my life became successful, you'll be amazed. And in every major turn in my life where I became successful was because there was someone in a group somewhere who I didn't ignore. And they turned out to be a powerful influence in my life, even financially. So acquaintance is an important level. Don't ignore people. Uh, let me give you a few comments about being an acquaintance. Be alert to everyone around you. That's number one. Number two, be careful to wear a cheerful, friendly countenance. You know, some people look so ugly, you're afraid to talk to them. And some of y'all look so mean. Listen, no wonder why the person who got your money walked past you. <laughs> There's nothing as beautiful as a smile. And the problem with a smile is you can never enjoy it because it's on your face. A smile was never given for you. It was given for other people. So please, smile right now, please. You look so much better when you smile. Some of y'all look so serious. about the mouth's going to rebuke you. I ain't rebuke you, just smile. There are, there are people who, who want to wanna give you some money, but the way you look, like you're ready to... They take my money back home. You know, I, I really focus. I tell my wife all the time, I tell my wife, be nice to everybody. You don't know who they are. Elevators, train stops, airports. You know, and they look at you, and they look at you, look at you twice. And you're like, what you looking at me for? No, 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 they're looking at you. <laughs> so you look back, say, hi. And they come over. Uh, you Dr. Monroe? Yeah. I was trying to find you for five years. Man, I got this check. Let me write a check for you. I said, I'm so glad I smiled back at you. <laughs> after service one day, people were lined up, wanted to see me. And, and you know, most of the time, you know, pastors are tired after they finish ministry. And there was a long line. I was tired, man. I was like, I'm at 2 o'clock, everybody gone, 2.30. When the last guy in the line had a check for $5,000, I said, oh, Lord, I'm so glad. I ain't never going home early no more. <laughs> the guy said, I flew all the way from New Jersey, and I came on the ship. Came here today. I want to see you. And the Lord told me to bless you personally for $5,000. I could have gone home. I was nice to people. You know why most of you ain't married? Because the person was married five years ago. You avoided them. Matter of fact, you look so ugly, they went past. Hey, right? boy, with that. Hey, boy, say, wear a cheerful smile. Say it. Yeah, man, turn around, smile to somebody. It's just friendships begin with a smile. 
And don't cost you nothing, you know. <laughs> Number three, write it down. Learn and remember people's names. That's how you begin friendships. Uh, uh, w- what's your name again? Right, that's how important I am to you. <laughs> Number four, greet them by the name the next time you see them. Nothing is more beautiful than the sound of a person's name. That's the beautiful sound they ever hear is your name. That's why when you're in a crowd and someone calls your name, you look, they ain't talking to you, you look. They ain't talking to you. Yeah, who that? You know, they're talking to someone else, but your name is so important to you. You always think they're calling you. Remember, that. oh, yeah, man, I remember you. You, you Mary, yeah. Right away, Mary said, wow, you remember me. It's a beautiful thing to make friends and acquaintance. And number six, number five, rather, ask questions about their interests. That's just an acquaintance. You know, I can make friends in seconds. My wife probably see, see me do this all the time. I meet a guy in the elevator. My first question, hey, what's your name? Junior. Okay, fine. Uh, how's your family? I go straight to family. Why? Every human came from a family. I'm right away there shocked. My goodness. Somebody in the whole world want to know about my family. And this guy, I just met the guy for five seconds. But the minute you say, how's your family? Right away, they open up. I'm fine. Great, man. Huh? Are you married? Yes. Fine. Great. What, what kind of work you do? Interest. These are, these are casual questions that build bonds with people. We, we sometimes sit in a, in a meeting like this and sit there and never mention or talk to the person around us. Don't know what they did, what kind of work they're involved in, and guess what? They could be a solution to one of your problems. You know, you, you are demented and you need psychologists. The psychologist right next to you could help you. <laughs> and number six, this is the level of an acquaintance. Be a good what? Listener. Listen to people. When I talk to people, I look them right in the face. I look them right in their eyes. Why? You know, a lot of folks around me, I like look them in the face. I want them to know that I'm listening to them. People say to me all the time, they write me like this, they say, you know, Dr. Munro, I couldn't believe it. I met you for the first time, there's 5,000 people in there, and you spoke to me, and as if I was the only person there. They said that, that affected me, that's why I became a partner. I'm going to become a part of my ministry. $30 a month for five years, just because I looked in their eyes. Friendship. We need to learn how to, to build relationships. And guess what? It's important to have plenty of them. Because when life hits you, you've got to have a long list to choose from. Who can help you? Are you with me? Yes. yes. Some of you only got two, three acquaintances. And when life hits you, none of them can help you. <laughs> Develop a lot of relationships. I want you to leave this conference falling in love with people. You know, Jesus invaded people's space. Write that down. You must learn it. Now stop waiting for folks to come to you. Invade their space. He ran up to a woman at a well who was already mad. <laughs> and he invaded her life. He says, can I have some water, please? He went into her space. He don't speak to me. I ain't speaking to them. No wonder why you broke. Stop waiting for people to come to you. If you don't talk to me, I ain't talking to her. You are so dumb. That's why you're like, listen, the person who you didn't speak to is probably the human resource manager of another company who would have hired you, but because you avoid them, they had a couple space open to get a job, but you didn't talk to them. You don't know who you avoid. Acquaintance. And number seven, have godly interest in them. Now, acquaintance is important. Godly interest means God wants them to know him, and he wants them to be saved. So at that level, that's what you want. You want to make sure that they are spiritually okay. So you ask them questions, how's your life going? 
You don't got to say, do you save? That's the wrong question. How's your life going? Are you happy with your life? And they'll, they'll tell you. You know, I'm confused. My life ain't doing too well. I just got divorced. You know, the, 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 the dog died. And, you know. <laughs> wow. Can, can, I, can I pray for your, your, your family, for your situation? Sure. See, you're interested in their spiritual life. You don't want to get married to them. It's just an acquaintance. And I tell you, 99 out of 100 persons would tell you pray for them. They wouldn't say no. Even though they don't want God, they'd say, thank you for even wanting to pray for me. That's acquaintance. That's, you have a godly interest in them. They'll never forget you. They see you again in the elevator, they say, hey, hi. You know, I really appreciate your talk in the elevator yesterday, man. That's, it's amazing. You know, people don't even talk in elevators. I really appreciate that you actually took the time to talk to me about my family. That's acquaintance. You know, do you know how many people give me their cards because I break friendship with them? Became a friend, give me the card. He said, Man, if you ever need anything, call me. I keep them cards. <laughs> There's a person sitting right behind you with a card. And they probably could connect you to a, a situation that could solve your financial problems. But you walk right out here, right past them, gone. Wouldn't even mingle in the lobby. Let me tell you all something. Most of life changes either in the lobby or the golf course. Wow. We go straight to our car. I got to go. I got to go. Listen, slow down. Most of the time, the people you're passing are your blessings. Get acquainted. Get acquainted. And the thing is, you got to be careful because sometimes the person you're passing is actually your outside brother. Oh, that's Bahamas. Bahamas got a lot of them now. You know, you're, you'd be amazed who's your sister. And you say, you mean, you've been in church for the last five years. I didn't know you was my sister. <laughs> you better ask them who your daddy is quick. All right, the second level is what? Casual friendship. This one is important. You move from acquaintance to casual. Now, casual is important. Casual friendships is based on common interests, activities, and concerns. That's all it is. Casual friendships. And you're learning to, to, to build these. Okay? And this is where you find people who have similar interests. Let me show you some of the items you want to look for. First of all, common interests. We both are interested in sewing. We both are interested in sports. In other words, you, you, you find this person likes some things I like. So we could talk about those things. You're a banker, I'm a banker. We could talk about the economy and different issues going on. You know, you're a nurse, I'm a nurse. Wow, you know, you're in the medicine, I'm in the medicine. You know, oh, you, you work in the, in the hotel, I work in the hotel. In other words, interest is what builds casual relationships. Number two, discover their strengths, their strong points. Find out where they are experts in, the, in the, what area. Because you may be able to, to, to actually help them help you. And let them know what your strengths are so you can serve them. That's casual relationships. Find out what people's strengths are. Number three, learn about their hopes and dreams. You know, what, so what are you planning to, to do with your life the next 10 years? That's a casual relationship question. Really? You want to go back to school? Hmm. Great. Well, you know, me too. I want to go back to school too, you know, to try to upgrade myself. So now you start talking about common interests. And now you start talking about hope. Dreams, desires, you're building a relationship that is very meaningful. And that's all it is, it's casual relationship. And the third is show interest in their problems. So why can't you go to school? Well, you know, I don't have any money. Really? Well, you know, I think there's a way that we can probably work this out. You know, I have some friends who have had some contact with some people who could give scholarships. And you start finding a way to solve people's problems. That's a casual relationship. And then you move... To questions like acknowledge your own strengths and weaknesses. Tell them, here's what I can do. And here's what I cannot do. Here's some things I know. Here's some things I, there's some things I don't know. In other words, you want to build a relationship on how you can help a person with their life. You ain't talking about getting married to nobody. And this could be male or female. Both, both, both sexes. doesn't matter. You want to, humans are what you want to work with in casual relationships. All right? And number, number five, talk to God about those people's needs and dreams and desires. A casual, a casual relationship is somebody who you have met more than three times. Okay, I, I use that figure. You met a person more than three times, you spoke to them, that's a casual relationship. 
you start talking at this level. And then you find, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you that you get that scholarship. But that means a lot to that person. You didn't ask them nothing deep. You just wanted to know what were their dreams. You tell them, I'm going to pray for your dreams. What a beautiful friend to have, eh? Yeah. The third level of friendship is close friendships. Now, notice I put fellowship with this too, because a close friend is one you have fellowship with. Now, you can't fellowship with an acquaintance, and you don't fellowship with a casual friend. But you start getting at a deeper level. A casual friendship frequently progresses to level four, close friendship and fellowship. And here's what this is based on. It's based on mutual life goals and friends. We got similar friends, and we got similar goals. So now we're getting into close commitment with one another. The second is you work on mutual projects. In other words, you know, we are close friends, and you want to buy a car. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can contact my friend who sells cars and see if we can get a discount for you. In other words, you start helping the person solve their problems because you have similar interests, and you also have a goal that you want to help them fulfill as well. Number three, involve genuine common fellowship. Fellowship implies mutual interest and in life in life and also in your goals. You know, uh, uh, this is when you begin to really talk a lot about what a person wants to achieve. You spend time with a person talking to them about their goals and their desires. This is what you call close friendship. Uh, you're no longer just, you know, uh, casually talking about, you know, what, the, what their interests are. You're concerning about now, how can I help you achieve it? So this is a much deeper relationship. And uh, again, we're not talking about, you know, getting married, going to sleep with nobody. This is just casual, close friendship, fellowship. Share similar values and ideals and worldview. This is one that's very important. You don't want a close friend who don't share your values. I value my sexual purity. Well, if you're my friend, close friend, you value the same thing. So you wouldn't invite me to have sex with you. You protect my, my things I, I value. So friends who are close have common values. They also have common ideals. What is their idea of standards? What is the correct relationship standards? They, they set the boundaries. Our ideals, the ideas that we believe in are similar. You know, uh, you believe in Buddha, I believe in Hare Krishna. You know, that, that ain't ideals together. Okay, so uh, close friends have the similar ideals. If, you know, our ideas about God are similar. Our ideas about sex are similar. Our ideas about money are similar. I, our ideas about saving money is similar. In other words, you begin to, to deal, connect on, on the idea level. That's a close friend. All right? The next one is... They are viewed as a potential mate. Now, this is where you start getting into, you know. You see, if you and I believe the same thing, have the same goals, we are looking at the same interests, and we have similar destinies, we can probably go there together. So, how do you know if someone is a potential mate? Check the list. You know, you see different values, and different ideals, and different interests. This person ain't a good mate. Not a good potential. They look good and they smell good. They got plenty of money, but their ideas are different. Their values are different. What they value, you don't value. And what they value is different from what you value. You value going to prayer meeting. They value watching TV. When you get married, how are you going to take that person to prayer meeting? The values are different. They value staying home, watching TV. You value going to prayer meeting. So now the marriage is already in trouble because you got two different locations every Monday night. And it won't be soon until that person says, I tired you going to prayer meeting and leaving me at home. <laughs> You'd be home cooking for me. So now you have this problem in your relationship because you didn't check the ideals and the value systems. Close friendships are very deep. All right? Also, you are willing to assist with their life's goal. You know, when you are a close friend, it doesn't mean you can get married, you know, but you are so close that you are interested in making sure that they succeed. That's a, that's a close friend. 
And this could be, you know, me and you as, as, as men together. You're my close friend. Man, I, you know, I can call the bank, see if I can help you get a loan to take care of some things. That, that's, that's a close friend. I help you fulfill your life's goals. Assist with the challenges to life's goals as well. In other words, a close friend is someone who will also help you through your tough times. Here's the book. It's very important. Uh, I have an entire chapter on this section that's called Close Friends. This is the book I'm talking about. Okay? Now, all this stuff is in this book in detail. I did this work years ago. You know, I keep friends for a long time. People have been my friends for 30 years, 40 years, still friends. Because if you know how to make friends and keep them, those people become more valuable every year. You want people to be glad they saw you. Some people duck you when you show up. They, <laughs> why? You broke up friendships, man. You, you, you can't keep friendships. Always contentious and hurt people along the way and got a long list of people who you hurt, you know, and then you wonder why your life is so miserable. Being friendly and having friends and making friends and keeping them is valuable. Matter of fact, there's nothing more important than a friend. Jesus said, there's a friend that sits closer than a brother. A friend lays his life down for his friend. He, 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 he saw friends more important than family. Your family will abandon you, you know. Your friend won't. You need money? Don't call your family. <laughs> You again? Always begging. No, see, no, no. Don't uh, call your friend. Your friend can find a way to work it out. So, and the more of them you have, the better in your life. Because sometimes some of your friends ain't got nothing, and then others have. So you need to have a big circle of friends, you know, just to make sure that you got relationships that, that work and that, that count. All right? Yeah. And by the way, you can't expect people to help you who you hurt. The Bible says a brother offended is harder to win than a city with walls. You want to make sure that you don't offend people? Keep good relationships. I, I am always trying to restore relationships. I mean, I, when I see broken, I, I try to restore them all the time. I, I do all I can. I meet people and say, look, you know, man, you all get back together. Man, we, boy, why? Because I know the value of people. And by the way, people are usually temporarily insane. <laughs> so th it's not a permanent condition. So don't, don't throw them away. Absolutely. All of us go insane once in a while. We need people to tolerate us, you know, until we come back to our senses. Tell your neighbor, hang on, I'm coming back soon. <laughs> Number eight. Close friends are committed to their friend's success. Write that down. You can tell if you are close friends to a person. They will do everything they can to help you succeed in your life. That's a close friend. Still ain't married, you know. Just a close friend. So you, this, imagine, how, imagine having 10 people like this in your life. What a wonderful life that would be. 10 people around you want to make sure you succeed because you learn how to build good relationships. I'm telling you, you are one fr friend away from wealth. You are one friend away from joy. One friend away from success. And this is why we need to learn how to build friendships. Now the highest level is intimate friendship. This is a deep one. The highest level of friendship is committed to developing each other's character. It's gone to a deeper level now. And this is where you get into intimacy. Because this is where you start dealing with a person's inherent nature. This can be very irritating. Character is formed by conflict. It is exposed by conflict. So intimate relationships will have conflicts. But the conflicts are not necessarily dangerous. Hmm. A person who is intimate with you can tell you off 
and then bust out laughing. <laughs> Why? They're working on your character. You know better than that. How, how dare you do that? Are you crazy? And then they fuss you. Why? They love you so much. They can't afford for you to lose something. That's valuable. That's a good conflict. Intimate friendships. Let's talk about how this works, all right? First of all, freedom to correct one another. Intimate friendships confront each other without fear of losing the person. Married couples need to learn this. Because your wife confronts you doesn't mean that she hates you. Because your husband tells you something, confronts you with something, doesn't mean that it's an enemy. That's character building. <laughs> Number two, open to being vulnerable. This is a tough one. This is where love gets involved, you know what I mean? I'm talking about love, not just likes. Love is really a, a, a difficult thing because love is making yourself vulnerable to a person. That's why love is 100% faith. Faith work it by love. You tell a person all of your inward parts. You reveal to them all of your secrets. That's vulnerability. And they could use that against you. But guess what? That's love. You got to have faith that they are not going to hurt you with that. That's, that's intimacy. Intimacy. And this is what people don't ever get at sometimes because they are, they are stuck. They, they get involved physically first and they're blocked at acquaintance. Some people never get to real love. Sex is not love. If sex was love, no one have more love than a prostitute. Don't ever tell someone, let someone tell you, because I love you, let's have sex. This is, a, this is crazy. If you love me, you let me. That's a lie. It's, this, you go have a prostitute. No. Let's sit down and talk intellectually for see if you are intellectually compatible to me. So I, very, I see if your psychological stamina can be intellectually compatible to my psychosis. So you're the essence of my psychotic nature to see if you can talk to me intelligently with words that I can understand. <laughs> what do you hear? Mm, 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 mm. What is, mm. I need some words. Open to being vulnerable. Number three, share the same vision, goals, and aspirations. Notice the word same is there. Intimate relationships are usually built on the two P persons sharing the same vision. This is important. This is why you can actually get married to that person. Marriage is not kept together by love. It's kept together by vision. And if your visions are different, I can predict your future. You will get a divorce. No doubt about it. Because when you have two visions, die is, means two. Die means two. Division? You go in two different directions. The prefix die means two. Vision is optica. It means single sight. Die vision means two sights going in opposite directions. You, you, if you don't have the same vision, you're not intimate. Hmm. When you talk about a single person concerning getting married to someone... Don't ever ask the person if they love you. That's the wrong question. That question is, 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 that's like the fourth question you ask. The first question you ask is, where are you going? I'm serious. The question is, where are you going in life? Because you want to make sure that you want to go with them. Don't, don't, don't let love fool you. What is your vision for your life? This is why movie stars can't stay married, you know. This is the reason why you study Hollywood stars and big singers and stuff like that, you don't know why they got problems? Because they usually marry someone in the same industry. Now, you may think that's a blessing. 
That's a curse. Because they got, all of them got their own career goals. It's important to marry somebody who's willing to submit to your vision or help you fulfill it. You marry somebody with a separate vision. They go in their own way, and you go in your own way. You got problems from day one. It's like, you know, what are you doing? Shared vision. Number three, deep commitment to each other. And this word commitment is very, very important. Uh, commitment to each other means that I am committed to your success above everybody else. I'm committed to you. Number four, committed to the other person's development. And this is important. Uh, again, you know, <laughs> when you are uh, committed to someone's development, it means that you will invest in them. You, you go there and buy them books. Say, look, I, I, I want you to read this book. So I bought it for you. I think this book would help us. That's, that's commitment to a person's development. You know, the seminar coming up tomorrow, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pay your entrance fee to get in. That's commitment to somebody's development. You know, there's a course coming up, uh, you know, for something. Uh, I am willing to pay your registration to go take that course. Man, that's commitment. You don't do that for casual friends. Or not even close friends. That's intimate stuff. I want you to improve. Do you know why you commit to someone's development? Because when they improve, you get an improved product. Matter of fact, these are important statements for you to remember to ask people questions who are interested in you in the next few weeks. If they said they're interested in you, tell them, okay, uh, are you develop interested in my development? This is just a, a serious question. Are you committed to helping me fulfill my goals? I told you when I want to go back to school. Uh, will you be willing to help me do that? If you marry me, you got to have children. Sit down, have children. Have children. You ain't going to no school. Right away, you know we can't get married. You know, and we so dumb. We say, I still love him. Yeah, but then, you know, you, you, in the back of your mind, you hate him because he kept you from your goals. So you got to make sure, clear the air when you talk about intimacy. And none, none of this is sex. Number four, five rather, look up for each other's welfare. Number five, deep respect for others' values and standards. Intimacy does not violate the other person's values and standards. If someone tells you, look, I don't like you to touch me there. If you are intimately involved with that person, you won't violate that. I don't like, the, I don't like when, you, when you do certain things. But you, you respect that. That's intimacy. Intimacy is not about you getting what you want. It's about making sure the person have what they need. It's not about you meeting your needs, you know. It's about meeting the other person's needs. That's intimacy. Intimacy is about making sure the other person is comfortable. Intimacy is making sure the other person is happy. Intimacy. Number five. Boy, it's sure quiet in here. <laughs> this one is tough. Intimacy means open honesty with discretion. And I put discretion in it in my book because, you see, there's some things you shouldn't tell each other even though you're intimate, you know. You got to be careful how you even... Because if you love someone... You don't want to necessarily do or say something or tell them something that will destroy their trust. There's some things that ain't worth talking about. So be discreet, even though you are open and honest. Be discreet. Got to manage your secrets. Can I put it that way? Manage your secrets. If if if, if a person don't need, if a person don't want to know something, you gotta tell them. Sometimes people volunteer information and destroy a relationship. You know I got five children in Andrews, eh? <laughs> Gee, I didn't ask you that. You know I got a husband in Jamaica. What? <laughs> but 
y'all seen dumb people do dumb things like that? They, they bring up stuff. You no, know, this is, you got divorced 10 years ago. Why you bring that up? You know, but we somehow, we, you know, we feel like, you know, we got to be all open. No. Listen to Jesus' words. I have much to say to you now, but you cannot receive it. Let me, let me repeat what he says. Jesus said, I have much to say to you now, but you cannot receive it. Information is given not because of what you know, but whether the person is ready to receive it. So you got to be discreet. Is this helpful tonight? I hope so. All right. Almost finished. Intimacy means you provide comfort and support to someone. You don't comfort a stranger. Oh, you in the elevator. Oh, call me out of your mama died. Brother said, don't touch me. I don't know you. What do you mean? I know my mother died, but you ain't that close to me. <laughs> Intimacy means you comfort a person and you provide support for them. Number 10, responsibility for their reputation. This is a tough one. When you are intimate with somebody, you protect their reputation. That's an intimate friend. A friend will defend you. I know everything about you, but I won't tell anybody. I love you too much. That's intimacy. That's the way God loves us, you know. He knew everything but you, but he don't tell nobody. He put in the sea of forgetfulness. He forgets it himself. He don't want to remember it, he says. I remember it no more, he says. I don't want to remember what I know about you, he says. What a beautiful intimacy, eh? What a way you should live with someone who is you close to, huh? I, I decide to forget everything I know and decide not to remember it. There are two different things, you know, forgetting and not remembering. Two different activities. And intimacy provides both. Very important. And number 12, I think, commitment to faithfulness, loyalty, and availability. The last one is one we don't think about. If you're intimate with somebody, you're always available to them. I need, I need to see you right now. Okay, I'm, I'm coming right now. Stop what I'm doing. I'm coming right now. That's intimacy. Intimacy means that the person's interest is your priority. This is the level of marriage. Uh, you can be intimate, intimate with a friend. Not, look at that list. There's no sex there, hey. You can have an intimate friend. Two men can have an intimate friend like David and Jonathan. They had, they had, they had, they had. People think that David and Jonathan were homosexuals. No, they were close friends, the Bible says. They were friends. They were intimate friends. They shared their goals and their desires. Jonathan defended David before his own father. Your reputation is important to me if we're intimate friends. I discovered something, but I ain't gonna tell nobody. He was my friend. That's intimacy. Two women can have this relationship and not be lesbians. Look at the, look at the list. That's, tell them, that's my friend. Don't talk to my friend like that. That's just a friend. Did you all pay to come in here tonight? You only pay for this kind of stuff, you know, anyhow. All right, let's, 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 let's close it up. Write this down. Friendship is not a gift. It's a result of hard work. And I think you could see just from this short session how much work it is to be a friend. You move through those stages. You begin with acquaintance. You move to casual. Then you promote it to close. And then you move into intimate. That's a journey. You can't become friends overnight. That's why you shouldn't get married. You're talking about, you know, uh, uh, what you call it? Love at first sight? You must be crazy. <laughs> that, ain't, you know, that, 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 that ain't possible. You know, you, you might maybe lust at first sight or something, but not love. You love, love is deep, and this thing takes time. You got to grow into this. I would tell people years ago when I was a kid, and I could figure this out when I was a teenage, teenager. I used to teach this when I was a teenager, you know. I tell people, if you fall in love, you can fall out. 
But if you grow in love, boy, the root tight. Don't fall in love with a dreamer. He'll break your heart every time. He's right. How many of you fell in love? <laughs> hey, Cheryl. Boy, I saw him today. I found him. Found him. She's the one. She is who? Slow down. Become acquainted first. Find the interest. You might be shocked what they're interested in. And the way they look doesn't tell what their interest is. Yeah. The best way to make a friend is to be one. Solomon says, he who would have friends must show himself friendly. That means you don't wait for people to come to you. He who would have friends must what? Must show himself friendly. That means you got to move out of your little world. Hmm. And by the way, it ain't difficult to, to be friends. Just follow my advice. It's easy. Tell the person, hey, what's your name? My name is Cheryl. Good. Where are you from? Bay in town. <laughs> yeah, what kind of work you do? This is not prying. These are casual questions. Oh, I'm a nurse. Really? Which, which, which hospital? Doctors. Wow. How long have you been a nurse? Five years. Great. Man, my mother was a nurse. You know, that's, that's hard work. Yeah, I know. So do you have, like, you know, time off to get to your family? And Well, you know, I work overtime. And you start casual talks. You build a friendship. When they see you again, they remember you. Because you were interested in their life. You know, I, I would go to the food store. I, <laughs> the girls cash in. I cash register people. I'm very good people to me. They cash in, you know, they cash in up my groceries. I was in cash register I was there yesterday. And the girl working. I said, how are you doing today? She said, oh, I'm, I'm okay. I said, great. I said, uh, what's your name? She looked at me. She said, no one ever asks us our name. I said, I know. She said, my name is Charlene. I said, that's a beautiful name. So uh, how long have you been working here? She said, two years. I said, well, at the time she working, you know. I said, uh, what do you, what kind of work you wanted to do before you did this? She said, well, you know, I used to work, you know, in a hotel. I was uh, at the front desk, and they had to lay me off, so I had to get the best job I can. I said, you mean you got experience as a front desk manager? She said, yes. It's a temporary job. And she sat there, couldn't believe I was talking to her. When I finished, I gave her $5. She was about to cry right there in the food store. Friendship. We just pass people. Now when I go back to that food store, she can be friendly. Let me tell you who to make friends with most of the time. is your waiter. The server in the restaurant, you better start off. Ask my wife. She tell you, I start off right away. Tell my wife, tell me, you, got, you, you ask all that? I say, yeah, all of that. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Tom, really? Wow, how long have you been working here? Five years. Wow, man, Tom. Yeah, man, so how's your family, Tom? Family's fine. Everybody's home good? Yeah, anybody sick? No. You know, and by the time I finish with Tom, Tom, make sure you don't spit in my drink. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know what you're drinking because you all treat the fella bad. Build friends and protect your health. <laughs> You'll be amazed. Number three, all success is related to what? Relationships. I think I'll rest here. All success is related to relationships. For you to be successful in life, it depends on the relationships that you build. A thousand stories in my life. Building relationships. 
people remember you. And when you need them the most, they show up. And the person who could help you is the person you may be avoiding. This seminar, the next three days, come to every session and move around. Don't sit in the same seat. Sit next to people who you don't know. Because we have a tendency to always go to the people we know. We don't develop friendships. Somebody stand in the lobby, break, break out of your little, you know, everyone got a little world, a little bubble. Break out and say, hi, how you doing? My name is, what's your name? And break out. Break out. You know, you ain't looking for nothing except relationship, that's all, just friendship. It's my hope that these next two days, you'll break out of your little world and get to know some people who can pay your bills. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have some questions. Uh, all right. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Stand up on your feet, Dave.